All right, so every time some, uh, some, I bring up like veganism, people are always like, can't we just eat the animal after it dies of natural causes? <laughs> Actually, that is a loophole. Just so you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't raised this way. I was a meat eater. Even when I found out about it, I was like everyone else. I didn't want to stop. Even though I was going to the slaughterhouses, I was crying and weeping. I was filming some of this stuff. I still was a stubborn addict. One night, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking my brain. I'm like, oh, there's got to be a loophole. How can we do this? <gasps> no slavery, no murder. Now, I, I, I'm always honest. So that, that is a loophole. You want to walk through the woods and find an old rabbit, an old squirrel, an old deer that died? I have no ethical objection. Now, I have a health concern, but as I said during the speech, I'm not the health police. You want to make yourself sick? I don't give a shit. You want to kill yourself? I think you've got a right to kill yourself. It's your body. But here's my dilemma with this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about this in a story, true story. So there's an animal sanctuary in Michigan called Sasha Farm Animal Sanctuary. It's in Manchester, it's about a half hour past Ann Arbor, maybe 35, 40 minutes. Uh, about 2004, 2005, I'm heading up there uh, with my friend Kate at the time. And as we're driving up and getting closer to the sanctuary, we see one of our sheep friends down in the field. We knew he was sick. We knew this wasn't good for him to be just down in the field. We sped up, we ran out, we jumped out of the car, we ran in the field, and we got there and Sebastian was dead. Nobody harmed him. Nobody killed him. He was about 20 years old, had a nice life, had sheep and goat friends, horse friends, had a huge field. He was a happy guy. Monty, who runs the farm with his wife Dorothy, sees us out in the field, so he comes out and realizes something's wrong. So we're standing there in silence. In silence. Morning him. I turned to Kate. She looked at me. I just went like this. I turned around and started walking. She was right behind me. Walked to the barn. I grabbed a shovel. Gave her a shovel. I took a shovel. Monty, still standing there, he knew Sebastian better than we did. That's his sanctuary. You know, we visit over the summer. He sees us with the shovels. He's like, goes and he gets the tractor to pick up Sebastian's body. He meets us in the back of the sanctuary where we bury dead animals. We dug a hole, put him in. Now, later on that day, when we felt like talking about it a little more, I brought up what well, you just brought up, what I just confirmed to you. I said, hey, by the way, guys, you know we could have had a barbecue today. Could have sheared him down, made some hats and blankets and gloves. And they're shocked at me that I'm saying it's like, yeah, I'm like, hey. He killed. He died of old age. But now that we were thinking logically, rationally, compassionately, we actually did the only thing that was proper at that moment. We saw a dead body. Bury it. A corpse is not food. It's ridiculous what we're putting into our bodies and how we view animals. See dead bodies, you're supposed to bury them, put them back to the earth. How'd you get started? It was an accident. I didn't seek this out. I didn't want to be hated <laughs> by everybody I come into contact with. My stepdad is a clown in the circus. He took me backstage in my 20s. I saw the elephants being abused backstage, living in chains, swaying erotically. By the way, all the elephants in the back of the circus are chained up, front, left feet, back, right feet, chained to the cement floor, and they all sway all day long like this. Just to show you how identical animals and humans are when it comes to pain and suffering and emotions, you guys know what children and orphanages do most of the time? They rock back and forth on there. Elephants don't rock, they sway instead. Well, the neuroses happen for the same reason. No love, no mother, no stimuli, no natural environment. I didn't even know about the training, which is vicious. I told my buddy Darren about what I saw at the circus the day before, and he said, if you think they mistreat elephants at the circus, you should see what they do to pigs at the slaughterhouse. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I worked five blocks from Thornapple Valley in Detroit, near Eastern Market. I smell death in the air every morning. I'll call you in the morning and start killing them. So are you kidding me? Call me tomorrow. Call me about 8 o'clock. So they just start killing them. I jumped in my car 20 minutes later. I'm at Auschwitz. I'm on a slave ship. 
I don't know any other proper analogies that can be made. You have living beings being treated like their lives don't matter. Their lives don't count. Other beings causing that intentional pain and suffering. Mocking the pain and suffering. Laughing at them. This is a holocaust of monumental proportions. I was still a stubborn meat eater though. I went there every day after that for six weeks. Two to six hours every day because my mind won't let me grasp what I saw the day before. And if you think it's rough to watch the video, and I'm not saying it's not, I know some people turn away. Try being there when that's happening. You don't smell fear and death in a video. Both have disgusting aromas, a disgusting stench of fear. But I was stubborn like everyone else. I know what people are going through. Even though my heart is hurting, I can see that it's wrong. You don't need to be a genius to figure out that this is evil. I was still a stubborn addict. Now, I always saw six or seven trucks full of pigs waiting to be called in. And I would watch them as they pulled in. I never saw one pig ever willingly get off the truck. Never. Not even close to it. In fact, if you go to a website, I think it's the American Pork Council's website, something like that, Pork Industry Council of America, they actually have a guide to opening up and running a pig slaughterhouse. I'm going to paraphrase the first part. It's, uh, pigs won't get off the truck. They're not stupid. They know what's next. Quote, I want you to go on the truck with a poker, an electric prod, and shove it in their eye. They'll move then. And that's what I saw happen every day. Shoving pokers into the eyes of living beings to make them walk to their own murder. Not their own death. I don't like saying death. Death, you live a long life and you die when you're old. This is murder. How come Wendy's doesn't show that stuff in their commercials? About what they do to pigs on the truck. Get them off the truck. Always lying to you. Anyways, um, I started talking about the elephants to the guys at the gym and not the pigs. Maybe deep down I knew I was being a hypocrite, even though meat eaters never want to admit that, but I would tell the guys about the elephants and be like, what? After a couple weeks though, they started coming up and they said, hey, Yurofsky, come here. We've been talking about you while you weren't here. And we've determined that you're a hypocrite. You scream about elephants being abused in the circus and you eat dead cows and pigs and chickens and turkeys and fish. What's the difference? Now, I was like everyone else, hey, no, there's a difference. And what the difference is? I'm a grown-ass man, and I don't need to go to the circus every day, or ever, for the rest of my life. But I eat meat every day, three, four times a day. That's what's different. I actually got to do something and change my life. Well, you see the choice I made. I was being a hypocrite. If you claim to care about justice, if you claim to be opposed to discrimination, if you claim to care about dogs and cats, rhinos being poached, but you're eating meat, cheese, milk, eggs, and honey, you're a walking contradiction. You're loaded with hypocrisy. And I'm just going to ask people to take that out of your life. And, and I want to be clear about this. What humans do to animals is evil. It's the pure definition of evil. Individually, though, I don't think most meat, dairy, and egg eaters are evil people. They're good people doing bad things. My best friend Darren, 36 years since we were 8 years old, he's still not vegan. He's not evil. He's a lazy bastard. And he says it. That's why I stood my butt and he goes, Gary, dude, come on. Animals don't deserve this. Can't justify this. I'm too lazy to switch. What do you want? Well, I love his honesty. I hate his laziness. I hate his apathy, which is a big problem, too, but it's another issue to me. It doesn't make you evil, necessarily, because you're just apathetic. So I'm asking you guys just to get involved just, and, and make a difference on this planet. Instead of sitting around and watching all the problems that are going on in the world, this really ticks me off, and it doesn't matter what station, whether it's Fox News or CNN, say a Republican, Democrat uh, thing that I'm throwing out there. Everybody talks and talks and talks a good game and does nothing. The genocide in Darfur, homosexuals in Uganda are being executed, women in Afghanistan don't have equal rights. Yeah, I get that that's all evil, so what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it here? Unless you get on a plane and go to Sudan, go to Afghanistan. Go, so, you know, go to Uganda. You ain't making a difference here. This is your chance to stand up to all the injustice going on in the world. Say, that. you know what? I'm going to do something about this injustice. I'm going to stand up and oppose discrimination. 
Oppose it three, four, five times a day. This is what makes veganism the best thing that you can ever do. Because you can do it all the time and stand up for what's right. One of my favorite humans on this planet who passed away, Cesar Chavez, human rights activist for farm workers. Most people don't know he was vegan. Okay, he wrote essays about it. You can look them up online. I'm going to paraphrase, but here's what he basically said. I oppose discrimination and injustice. That's why I do what I do for the farm workers. How can I come home and consume discrimination and eat injustice? So I have to be vegan. If you claim to be a good-hearted person, you have to get on this path. You have to make this change. This is the world's biggest massacre. These are the most abused, most oppressed beings that have ever lived. The world's forgotten victims. Okay, um, so remind me, you said that you were a Jew, and you said that you don't oppose the guy, you oppose the things that you just follow the guy. Um, so what do you feel, what is your view on uh, the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve said God clothed them with animal skin? First of all, these, these are stories, we don't know exactly what happened there. The Garden of Eden was a vegan haven. It was a perfect paradise. And as I talked about God pretty, in pretty good detail during the speech, um, I don't believe in books. God's not in a book. Humans write books. These are our, you know, our theories about what happened. I know that God's perfect paradise is cruelty free. That's all I know. And if God did decide to do something, well, I guess God can do whatever He wants. We're not God. We certainly can't be playing God, which is what we do with the animals and with other human beings too. Keep in mind the four, as, as much as I dislike books, people like to talk about books, so I'm going to throw a few things out there. Uh, the four most important words in that entire Bible, in fact, in the Koran, in every religion, thou shalt not kill. Can you get around that? It's not open for interpretation, although it's been open for interpretation forever. Remember, we have excluded many human beings from the thou shalt not kill mandate over the so, um, actually, I want to show you something. I never get to show this. I've been in uh, Israel the last couple of years. My speech is very popular there. They put Hebrew subtitles on it. Uh, let me just show you a three-minute clip. This is me in Israel. And by the way, check out my Bible in Jesus section if you want more uh, detailed stuff. This is uh, again a three-minute clip. Speciesism. It's the first form of hatred humans are taught. Way before racism, sexism, and heterosexism, heterosexism is taught, speciesism is the first form of hatred. Let's eradicate that, and then maybe we can eradicate all the other forms of hatred, because I'll tell you what, I know the way we're doing it right now isn't working. Eating meat, cheese, milk, and eggs certainly isn't making this world a better place. It's making the world a worse place. Let's make an effort. And as we talk about evolution, by the way, I don't want to force evolution on people out there that are creationists. Real quickly, if you believe in creation, by Judaism, Christianity, Islam, look no further than the Garden of Eden. Oops, the Garden of Eden, that vegan haven where Adam and Eve were the first vegans on this planet. Genesis 1.29, God's first dietary laws, I give you seed-bearing plants for food. God's last dietary laws, Isaiah 11.7, the wolf will live with the lamb, the cow will feed with the bear, the lion will eat straw like the ox, a child will lead them, and no one will harm on my holy mountain. It is clear and unambiguous, the beginning and the end are and will be vegan. So why don't we strive towards these perfect states? And for my religious friends that are out there, I learned a really valuable lesson last time I was here in Israel last September. They took me to see the holy city, Jerusalem. I say this with vehement sarcasm because there ain't nothing holy about it. Because as I walked into Jerusalem first, I passed 3,000 vendors hawking items. Hey, stars of David, crosses, Bibles, Korans, tosses, young guys, what you need. As my wife Erica was grabbing everything and looking at me, made in China, made in China, made in China, made in China. Yeah, that's what everybody, that's what God wants, sell some stuff in my name. Then we got into the Wailing Wall area. Boy, that was a treat. Because what did I see but 400 people standing in front of a fucking wall going like this? It's a wall! You're praying to a wall? God is not in a wall. He is not in a book. He is not in a star. I'll tell you what God is in, because I know what he's in. 
God is in his creations. How come religious people refuse to worship anything that God made, but worship everything that we made in his name? Boy, let a Bible fall on the ground. Boy, so you make the power. Boy, let the towers, towers touch the ground. Oh my God, the towers touch the ground. Boy, but an animal that God created, hey, kill him. Kill that son of a bitch right now. Cut his horns off right now. Fuck him. Take his baby away. Screw him. Every animal that God made, God is inside of. And if you kill animals, you are murdering God. And that is blasphemous and obscene. Wake up, religious people. Wake up. Because I'll tell you what, I believe in God. And I respect the things that God made. The water, the air, the oceans, the forest, and his animals. He's not asking too much. Stop doing rituals. God is not impressed if you have a really long beard, by the way. You got a really big hat. You think God's up there, hey, look at that guy with that hat on. That's one of my most favorite creations. The guy with the big hat. That was all off the cuff, by the way. That's where the religious section was born. I do crack myself up sometimes. <laughs> By the way, this is one of my favorite quotes, too. I always got to put this out there when we talk about God. A missionary was walking in Africa when he heard the ominous padding of a lion behind him. Oh, Lord, prayed the missionary, grant in thy goodness that the lion walking behind me is a good Christian lion. And then in the silence that followed, the missionary heard the lion praying, too. Oh, Lord, he prayed, we thank thee for the food which we are about to receive. No fun when a rabbit's got a gun. We'd all be singing a different story if we were the victims here. It's time to love in the name of God, by the way. And enough with the killing in the name of God. I think we can all agree that all religious people of all faith have committed horrible atrocities in God's name throughout the eons. This is just another one added to the list. Added to the list of horrible injustices that people commit in God's name. What year was that Georgia Tech plan? Georgia Tech was 2010. And by the way, I did not even film that, nor did I post it. One of the students there did. I had been speaking for eight years doing lectures before that and never shared it with anybody. I'm also a solo activist. Uh, I personally don't believe in working uh, with other people. I don't. I think it just brings you down. I think there's too much uh, paperwork and bureaucracy taking place. If you want something done right, do it yourself. That's the adage, and this is what I started doing. And, I started this in 2002, and if I, yeah, if, if it's weird because if that student never recorded it, posted it, man, it, I'm so glad that this kid Nathan did it. But wow, because the, the latest stats right now, I think I mentioned Israel. Israel is uh, the media in Israel is reporting that my speech has converted more than 10 percent of their population. So now that this speech has gone global, that Georgia Tech speech, the conservative estimate is that I've converted about a million. When I was at the Global Climate March, more than one person sent me the link to your speech. Yeah, it's, it's really out there now. And, and what's what's amazing or weird or ironic, I don't push it. I don't promote it at all. Again, I'm just, just, I know people don't get this, and everybody thinks everyone's out for themselves. I, I never wanted fame. never wanted fortune. I want people to listen so the animals have it better. But that's it. I've turned down three or four book offers over the years. What am I going to say that hasn't been written 10,000 times? There are already 10,000 books about animal rights. Why should I write one? Just to be selfish, there is my book. Now, I do have a book. It's my, it's my website. It's my speeches. I have audio books that no one else is doing. But I also turned down Ted. You know, Ted, uh, I turned him down twice in Israel. Too many rules, too many restrictions. I don't, as you can probably tell, I don't like rules. They want no slaughterhouse video. I go, well, there ain't going to be no speech. Well, okay, but you only get 20 minutes. And that ain't going to work either. I do 40 minutes and I do it my way. Well, we want to edit your stuff. Um, okay, you know what? I don't need you guys. Leave. Leave. Toss them out twice. So I, I'm not, I honestly mean it. Everything when I say for free, my website's free. I don't sell anything on my website. If I'm promoting a product, it's because I really like that product. I'm not getting compensated from any of these companies, although I should. <laughs> I should. I promote the hell out of vegan food companies. They don't give me shit. So how do you afford to travel? I have. Now the universe takes care of me. Here's something maybe even weirder than that from 2008 to 2010 before, before this guy jumped on board. I did know my sponsor. And he was a meat dairy egg eater. For three years, sponsored my vegan tour. 
this is why I work solo. The animal rights movement is just like all the other movements that are all fucked up. And they can't get past their own bureaucracy and BS and politics. Uh, because I'm too radical, the movement doesn't support me. Because I'm too real and genuine. Because I'm not a politician. Because I don't lie. Because I speak the truth. So the meat eater saved the tour in 2008. It was amazing. I'll tell you a real quick funny story. Um, I knew of him because he had given me a $5,000 donation years before that. When I lost my donor in 2008 for the umpteenth time, I didn't know who else to contact. So I'm like, hey, Rich, uh, remember that five grand you gave me a couple of years ago? I'm not even sure I said thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> any chance you want to give me about 70 grand so I can continue my tour? I'm not a salesperson, as, as you can tell. And really, that was the email. <laughs> He's like, okay, can we get together and talk about this? I said, yeah, absolutely. Where, where, you know, where are you at? I didn't even know where he lived. He goes, oh, I'm in the San Francisco area. I said, oh my god, I'm going to St. Mary's College in uh, three weeks. My ride is like half an hour away. He said, well, let's go out to lunch. So I meet him. We meet at a vegan restaurant, so I'm still assuming he's vegan. We sit down. He starts telling me about some foie gras that he ate. That's the pate, the, 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 the duck liver. They shove a pole down the throat of a duck or a goose and force feed them, like one of the sickest things we do to any animal. He's telling me the story at the table. I'm going, I don't hide my emotions, as you can probably tell, too, so I'm just like, okay. In my head, I'm going, don't yell at him, Gary. He might fuck you to it. <laughs> but the other thing is, I'm just I'm thinking, okay, he's telling you a joke. Calm down. Wait for the punchline. And it was horrible, and it was so bad, I sent it back. Now I'm realizing no punchline is coming, and now I'm like, in my head, like, oh my god, this duck had a steel pole shoved down his throat. You're not even going to eat it? You sent it back? Oh my, he sees it now in my eyes. He's like, oh, did you think I was vegan? Yeah. I'm not. Well, yeah, you can tell that. Why are we here? It's because you got the best speech I've ever heard in my life. And even though I'm not vegan, I will be one day. And I think everybody should hear your message. And so, yes, yes, I will find you too. <laughs> no, no vegan stepped up to save the vegan tour, but the meat, dairy, and egg eater did. Now, this is why I also say, when I said before about most meat, dairy, and egg eaters are not evil. Good people doing bad things. There's another guy who admitted he's going to be vegan. He knows I'm right. He knows this argument is correct. It's just, you know, the time wasn't right for him to make this change for whatever reason. Doesn't let him off the hook. He still felt my wrath. He still heard me screaming at him too, you know, like I yell at everybody and go off on them. But um, he is another stubborn blocked, blocked vegan. I guess some people call them you know, the meat dairy night eaters. Just stubborn, stubborn, stubborn uh, blocked vegans. Why is honey not vegan? Honey, uh, good question. Um, by the way, if you go to my website uh, in the All About Veganism section, really utilize that to find answers to tons of things. Here's a bees and honey section. Real quickly, most people don't realize that bees are actually vomiting for a reason, and I'm not being sarcastic when I say vomit. Honey is a regurgitation. So number one, you should not be eating somebody else's vomit. And don't tell me, ah, oh, it's no big deal, because if I brought you a plate of food and sneezed on it first, you'd freak out. <laughs> I see people at restaurants, vegan and non-vegan restaurants, I see people, oh, there's a piece of hair in my food, oh my god, a piece of hair. And then people are taking bottles of vomit going, hey, just put this on my oatmeal and on my syrup, man, it's great. <laughs> okay, it's vomit. It is not food. Now, bees, the drone bees, the worker bees, will only vomit if the queen bee is present at the apiary. I think most people know apiaries are not enclosed environments. Not like a factory farm warehouse building where there's 50,000 chickens inside and they can't get out, or a fence around the cows where they can't get out. Apiaries are open because the bees have to go out and pollinate and then come back. Okay, so how do you make sure, though, the queen bee always comes back and stays there? This is the sickest thing that we do to any animal. If you ask me to rank it, all the cruelty, and I don't like to, cruelty is evil to me, but if you have me rank it, the worst thing we do to any animal happens at an apiary on a bee farm. They actually rip the wings off of the queen bee. They rip her wings off. It'd be like me cutting off your legs today to make you stay and listen to this piece. Taking away somebody's mode of transportation is evil. And this is standard practice. You can go online, there's a queen bee supply company. People, they actually order queen bees. They send them, send them the queen bees in the mail in a little ventilated box. As soon as they get the box, they open it up, they rip her wings up. So she stays there. Now, 
They also kill off the queen bees at around three years of age, even though in the wild, queen bees live to their five or six. And now we're back to the mass murder, or to the murdering. Just like cows in the dairy industry are killed off at three to seven, even though cows can live to be 18 to 25. We're always murdering these animals way before their lifespans are over. So that's the main issue that's going on there. We're stealing something that doesn't belong to us. We're harming the queen bees. Now, just so you know, they are vomiting for two reasons. One, it's insulation for their hive, and it's food for themselves, or for their young, especially during the winter, you know, cold, cold, cold season. Now, if you go to uh, this link, the bee industry is mean and murderous, uh, there's a link to an essay on that link from an Ohio State animal agriculture professor, James Two, T-E-W. I love getting research, by the way, from the abusers, like that egg farmer I showed you. They always admit the truth at some point. Every animal researcher will always say during their protocol essay, this can never be extrapolated to human beings, da da da. So they always admit the truth at some point. Well, this guy, an animal ag professor, by the way, does not care about animals. Okay. He teaches kids how to kill animals, how to enslave them and oppress them. This is what he said about the bee industry, about the honey industry. He said, historically, beekeepers only took around 50% of the honey and left 50% as insulation for their hives, as food for them, you know, for their young. Now, stealing a little, by the way, doesn't make it okay. It's still theft. Then he went on to say, nowadays, beekeepers steal, he used the word steal, steal 100% of the honey and replace it with corn syrup and sugar syrup. Well, if you've been following the news for the last five to 10 years, five to 10 years, the bees are dying off, right? Bees are disappearing. What's happening to the bees? Well, there's a few things maybe we can look at. Pollution. Maybe they're suffering from all the pollution that we do to this planet. And when the bees start to go, we're not far behind. It is a warning sign. Uh, how about genetic modification? Maybe they're landing on plants and crops that have been altered and the cells are coming in in a different way, messing up, you know, their, 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 their brains, their, you know, their organs. But when I read that beekeepers are feeding bees high fructose corn syrup, and we're wondering why bees are dying off, you don't have to look any further. Look what high fructose corn syrup does to us. What do you think it does to them? And one more thing too, this is such an unnatural product. Now as I say this, I don't believe just because something is unnatural, I don't think that that makes it wrong, evil, or bad. Like there are some raw vegans who claim that cooking food is evil. Now listen, when you cook food, it's true, you cook out nutrients. Think about broccoli that you boil in water, the water's green. I get that, but you haven't turned it into sludge, you just boiled out some nutrients, right? That's all it is, you just take it out some. But this is something that is unnatural and so bizarre, because let's say you and I walk through the woods, not in, uh, not in uh, November, it was August, uh, I was smoking some purple diesel, some OG Kush, <laughs> and you're like, man, holy shit, here, there's a high, I'm gonna get some honey. I'm gonna be like, man, I'm gonna get that uh, okay, good luck, because I'm not going over there with you. Are you really going to walk up to the hive and go, hey, you're going to get stung mercilessly. You never stick your hand in a beehive. So this does not belong in our diet whatsoever. Now, good news, just like I talked about the vegan burgers, the vegan ribs, if you guys want a similar taste and texture of honey, agave, agave nectar. They sell it at every single grocery store. Uh, Yacon, Y-A-C-O-N, it's a root vegetable. They liquefy it, grind it up. It does the same thing as honey. And there's actually a rice honey that they're actually making from rice to mimic the taste and the texture. So keep in mind, you don't have to give up anything that you love to eat. When you become vegan, you just veganize everything. All right, you guys are great. Honestly, thank you so much for a nice, pleasant Q&A. I always like when people don't, don't turn it into a Jerry Springer show. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Um, you have my email address, you got my website, whatever you need, I'm always here to help.